Well, hello everyone. Uh, for those of you in Europe, a good evening. And maybe some of you from North America, good morning and good afternoon. And maybe there is few others from other parts of the world, uh, maybe in between. Hello again. Thank you so much for coming to our session, which is the last session of the first day of the um, Spatial Data Science Symposium. Uh, we bring the topic of converging on spatial data science. This is a panel discussion. And what we're going to discuss is some challenges and, of course, some opportunities as well as the spatial analysis and data science converge. Okay. Before we start, we would like to introduce ourselves, the four panelists for this panel. So let's start. How about we start with you first, Seda? Sure. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining from. I am joining from Boston, Massachusetts, and we have a thunderstorm today. So I was worried about my connection and I'm, I feel so lucky to be online today. Uh, my name is Seda Shalapaicha. I use she, hers as pronouns. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Geoscience at University of Massachusetts Amherst on Mount Ida campus, which is located in Boston area. And I am an engineer turned to geographer, and I um, consider myself as a GIS scientist, special pattern seeker, and map user. I have um, changed my special education locations through the time I started uh, my undergrad degree back in Turkey, and then moved to United States to do my PhD on geography. Um, I teach various levels of GIS for undergraduates and graduate students for, for about 15 years. Uh, and my research interests are special decision making models, uncertainty in decision making, and uncertainty visualization. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you, Seda. Uh, glad that you can join our panel. And next is Mala. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marcela Suarez. Um, I'm assistant teaching professor in the geography department at Penn State, and I work for the online geospatial education programs. Uh, I think we also have a thunderstorm right now, so I am a bit scared <laughs> looking through the window now, but yeah, uh, very happy to be here uh, with uh, all the team, all the panel. Uh, a bit about me, I teach courses in cartography, geovisualization, and GIS. Uh, special data science uh, at the graduate level at this moment and I used to teach at the ad undergrad level uh, yeah for lower division and upper division classes uh, in Santa Barbara in UCSB. Uh, I am mainly interested in spatial data analysis, data conflation, data quality and reliability visualization as well as their applications in disaster and emergency management. So uh, I was trained, my background is as cadastral engineer and geodesy. So yeah, another engineer turned into <laughs> geography. And it was in that program where I discovered GIS many years ago. Um, then I completed a master's in disaster management and emergency response because I saw the full potential of, of GIS in these tools helping people. And then uh, I completed my PhD in geography. Uh, so I just put a bit of more information in case you want to contact me later. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela. Uh, glad to have you in the uh, panel as well. Next is uh, Lauren. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Bennett. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And I am the program manager for Esri Spatial Analysis and Data Science. Um, capability, so our software development team, building our spatial analysis and data science capabilities into ArcGIS. Um, so that kind of spans a pretty broad range of areas from spatial stats and spatial machine learning to um, spatiotemporal analysis, raster and 3D analytics. Um, definitely my heart is in spatial statistics, which is where I've spent the last um, pretty much 15 years of my career here at Esri. Um, I'm a I also uh, spend a lot of time and, and resources advocating for the use of spatial analysis to address issues of racial equity and social justice. I'm a 
always been, you know, I'm I'm definitely not an engineer turned geographer, although I love working with engineers. Um, I'm I thought I was going to be a uh, I thought I was going to major in political science and international development studies. So I definitely came into geography um, with an eye on people. Um, and so seeing some of the opportunities that I think GIS has and spatial analysis has at this this very what feels like a really critical moment in time um, is really exciting, I think, because there's so much that needs to be done. And I think that spatial analysis plays a really big role in it. Um, and I think spatial data science in general has a big role to play in all these big problems that we're facing, not just in issues of equity and justice. Um, so yeah, I did my, I fell, I didn't, I fell in love with geography pretty early. Luckily I avoided not, I mean, political science and international development studies are great degrees, but I'm glad that I found my way to geography before I got one of them um, and got my master's and PhD while working at Esri. So really excited to be on such a um, powerful panel of really brilliant geographers. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Glad to have you in the panel as well. So uh, the last one is myself. I'm Kansarina Kurnia. I can pronounce she and her. I am a senior solution engineer at ASRI education team. And my main role is to provide technical advice and um, assistance to universities, to higher education as um, actually in advancing their GIS technology for teaching, research, or campus operations. And uh, I work very well with other teams like Lauren Bennett teams as well in spatial data science. So I'm leading the S3 spatial data science and imagery and remote sensing outreach to education community. Uh, my background for the education, I got a bachelor degree in landscape architecture. So I'm not an engineer. A landscape architecture from uh, IPB University in my home country, Indonesia. Then I took my master's degree in landscape planning from University of New South Wales in Australia, where I started to use GIS uh, and get uh, introduced and directly falling in love with GIS. Uh, so I've been in geospatial technology and S3 for more than 23 years, and I'm connecting from Redlands, California, a wonderful Sunshine, California um, today. So. Uh, with that, that's our introductions. We're going to have the um, fun uh, panels and hopefully a lively discussion as well. Before we dive in into the discussions, we would like to actually know the audience. There is a, about 40, 40 you all in the audience. We would like to know that first question is just participation. We have a full question asking from which part of the world are you connecting? just to get uh, the idea in here. So Kitty, can you help to, to post the full question, please? The first one. All right, so uh, let's see if everybody can help and participate to vote. Probably. All right. I guess it's a uh, Many of us waking up already in North America, so it's a it's larger portion is from North America. It's almost like dinner time in Europe, but we get about thirty one percent are from Europe. Awesome. Ah, we have a couple from South America and Asia as well. This is a global panel. Exactly, and some people are about to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I think we, we got the idea. Thank you so much again for coming to this panel. Well, we have another pull question in here. Um, so we know where you come from. The, the second question is, what is your primary roles? Now, I know many of you wearing different hats. You have more than one roles. Uh, this is a single answer question. We just want to know what is the primary one that, that you feel that you are. So let's see the foot here. We expect it's a lot of the researcher and also teaching professor, but we also glad to see there are um, students as well.
Well, this is interesting. Awesome. So we actually have a, a good balance and with the, if the more of the uh, researcher on this. Awesome. Thank you so much for your participations on this uh, pool question. So we get better idea on, um, on the um, audience in here. All right, so we're gonna dive in now into the, um, uh, our discussions. The way that we, we structure our discussion in this panel is through some of the questions, okay? So we have the five prepared questions in here, but we always welcome questions and comments from the audience. Now, this is a smaller group, so feel free to post your question or comments in the QA windows, and then we will cover them uh, for sure uh, in our session, okay? So with that, we're gonna start first with the question that we, we structured together in here. We start from the basic questions. What is the difference between spatial analysis and data science? Or if, if there is even a difference with that. Okay. So panelists, um, Seda, Marcella, uh, Lawrence, who do you want to start first? It looks like Seda is, is okay. uh, re ready to go. <laughs> I, I don't know, like, this is when we're trying to decide about the questions. I mean, this was a, like, I think, obvious I think we, we all agreed. Um, maybe they're not going to be like a discussion like thing. But when we talk about the special analysis and data science, I mean, I think we all agree that this is, I mean, we see the same thing. The, I, I think if if there's any difference between data science and special analysis, it's not that much visible to me because whatever we are doing already is data science. So we are as special data scientists just focus on not just the data but the special component of it, and that's what makes it important. And in order to do some special analysis, it's so tangled with the special data and statistics. So like where things are happening and how things are happening are all tied to each other. So I can't think them as separate things. Um, I don't know, how would you like to elaborate or, or Marcella? I definitely agree. I think that, um, you know, I mean, data science is obviously, it's in some ways, I think it's just a new word we're using to describe analysis um, and turning data into information and making use of data in all of these different ways. And I think that spatial analysis, certainly there's areas of data science that aren't spatial analysis, obviously, but I don't think there's any spatial analysis that we do that I wouldn't consider data science. So I consider it kind of this key um, sub area of data science because, and I think that we get uh, caught up in, you know, what, this idea of what data science is, there's this idea that it's just the really advanced machine learning and AI, um, but I, I don't I don't think that's what data science is at all. I think data science is everything from simple transformations of your data to um, even visualization of your data, all the way through to the the really cutting edge stuff. And so, even something simple like a spatial overlay or a buffer if it's answering the question that you have and uses the data that you've got to answer that question, to me, that's data science. And um, it's a data science that we as geographers are particularly well suited and and have the expertise to do really well. So I think it's a, a really important part of data science is how I would describe it. I agree. And, and I think it's interesting to hear the two of you because I think as geographers, I don't think we really see the difference because we are trained that way, but also it's because we are passionate about understanding what Seda just said, where things are and why they are where they are or why they happen where they happen. So from us, it's like, yeah, we know that we are now part of, or not now, but part of something bigger that is data science that, yeah, there are all their methods that don't consider this special, but for us, we usually do see the spatial component in each problem. And actually, in my case, I have been many times surprised that it's like, yeah, there, there is a method for that, like, like in geography, that we didn't call it 
data science before. But yeah, of course, yeah, that's the overlap. I don't think it's necessarily the same way in the other, in the other direction because yeah, it's just a little part of that big thing uh, that is data science. So. Although I love your point that um, that there's so many opportunities for kind of introducing a spatial component into so many areas of data science that don't actually maybe currently think about spatial mm -hmm. um, or even areas where they're doing spatial and um, don't even maybe realize it or aren't thinking of it that way. They just think of it as, you know, columns in a in a table that represent x y coordinates but we think about what that means in this different way and that there's you know it, it's this idea it is a subset of course it's a subset of course there's problems that have no spatial component but it probably is a much larger like that's probably even downselling the value that spatial brings into the field because of just how many of the problems that we're trying to solve as data scientists really are spatial even if we don't think about it that way or they don't think about it that way, more traditional data scientists. And also what we can think is like, can we link every data science question or can we turn them into special data science questions? If the answer is yes, then, then the question becomes, I think so obvious for me, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious about the audience too, if somebody disagrees with us. Yeah, I wish this was a yeah. poll. <laughs> yeah, there is a couple in the chat as well. You yeah, know, there is a, also think about the sam uh, spatial sampling of your data. To me, it's really like data science is so big and, and a data scientist is using data, extracting information and data from many different resources. And, and spatial data, especially lately, is a lot, a huge number of um, um, spatial uh, data available, people movement and things like that, that really like if you don't use it as, a, as part, it's, um, you're missing, I think, a lot. It's a, it's a, I feel that there is an added value for data scientists to use the spatial data because it is based on the scientific, scientific all the tools that they use is algorithm is all um, scientifically created, you know, so it's really like um, the visualization, the analysis, um, the processes, it's the same with the data science, it's, it's applied to the big data integrated with the machine learning, deep learning in general. So I feel that it's really like um, one opportunity to use the data uh, in the data science by the data scientists. Let's, uh, we've got Yvonne from um, TU Graz is, has um, made the kind of point that if you think about things like prediction, learning, and simulations, they fall under, um, you know, you, you're saying that, Yvonne's saying that they fall under uh, spatial data science, but not sure their spatial analysis. And I guess to me, I think of them as, I don't, I can't distinguish between those two terms. Like to me, spatial data science and spatial analysis are synonymous. Like where would, where would one end and the other begin? Like if it, it does machine learning not count as analysis? Cause to me, I, I think it is. I mean, I think they're both They're I, I wouldn't, I cannot come up with a reason that I would distinguish between what spatial analysis and what spatial data science in a way that's actually useful or meaningful. Like is our statistics spatial analysis or are they spatial data science and our statistics machine learning or are they not? I mean, those are such gray areas that I find that drawing a line between them, I'm not sure we gain anything by doing that. I, To me, it feels like when we draw a line, what we actually do is like exclude people um, or exclude concepts, exclude the power of some methods or approaches from others because it's like now, if it's not data science, it's not valuable or worth anything. And I think that that distinction feels mainly exclude <laughs> its purpose feels like it's to exclude, you know, and I don't know that we gain anything by doing that. That's my... I think it's also interesting because the, the time where we are, like, thinking about these terms, right, is, like, pretty much is everything because of, like, that boom with data, like, yeah. like with sensors, like, volumes of data sets that, yeah, 
yeah, we realized like the methods we were using for years, like it's like, yeah, no, we need something bigger, but it's like the same, like, yeah, I will agree in the same, in the, in the, that the root is still like, it's an analysis. It's, and no, yeah. So, yeah. I was just going to add, like, I am also curious about what's going to be in the future too. So some of the terms are just arrived, but we don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. So are we going to use the same terms? So the content is the key issue, I guess, here, whatever, we, no matter the name is. So, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I think Carolyn, hi, Carolyn. I think Carolyn's point um, is, a really good one. Like, I think the terms actually, <laughs> in some way, confuse things versus like, I, I, I think that's kind of what, that's my perspective is, is I think that it, it's come up. And so I think on some level, we have to embrace this term of data science and, and uh, consider ourselves spatial data scientists and think about it that way. Because if we don't, you know, we're not acknowledging this like evolution in how people are talking about it. But in some way, when you think about it, it's like, it, it really is, it, it, it's just science, right? We're, we're taking the, the data that we have, we're asking questions, we are making decisions. And people have been doing that since the beginning of time on some level. And so I do, it's just this evolution. And so I think we're kind of evolving our terminology and I agree that 10 years from now, it will be interesting to see where we end up. To me, it feels like the pendulum has swung really far in this direction where it's like, it's all about, you know, the, the it's, it's almost like this overuse of some of these terms and the hype, you know, we're at the top of this hype cycle. And I think, I hope that 10 years from now, we come to a more measured, understanding of the value of some of these new methods, but also the value of some of the kind of long standing methods and how they all are just in our toolbox and we should use the best approach to solve the problem and who what's who cares about the terms on some level, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I agree. Well for the for the interest of time, I think we're gonna continue here and 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 uh, evolve in the, our discussion. So I'm going to bring you all into the second question that we have in here. Uh, what are some of the challenges that we face as data science evolve and we try to make sure the spatial becomes a core component of the mainstream data science? Uh, in other words, is how do we navigate bringing these two words together, both in terms of academia and industry? Right. Uh, it's kind of like a, a nice uh, discussion point in here. So feel free to start first. So I can start from the, I mean, I'm coming from an academia and then teaching a lot of students, especially coming from data analytics background, um, some cartography and GIS courses. I would say that um, I would like to see my students thrive in, in every component. So they they cannot just uh, learn map making, but they have to know like what is the behind of a map, like map projections, cartography, they have to understand the basics because if they don't know those basic uh, foundational knowledge of GIS, uh, what makes a real cartographic end product that they will be showing uh, so, okay, here is my end product. Um, it, it wouldn't fulfill, I guess. Like, I, I, I still can't um, accept that idea about this. They can just create maps and don't know anything about the rest. So uh, maybe I'm so old-fashioned, old-school old about this, <laughs> but uh, that's, um, that's my point of view for the academia part. Um, I don't know if you agree, Marcella. As, as I, I yeah, I want to follow up uh, specifically. I think in the program I am teaching right now uh, at graduate level, there are many students that come from very different fields and they are doing a certificate or the master in, in GIS. And I have noticed, like even if uh, the, the program is completely online, like the classes are online, and even that I group them like two times in the term, I can see how that different background comes with also 
like how they feel about their contribution in the spatial work, right? It's like some of them, as we were thinking, uh, as we were talking with the other question, some some of them think it's like, yeah, I just use GIS, right? I It's like just use GIS. I have just used RGIS Pro or I just do maps uh, and that's all. Even if they are uh, answering questions that uh, they don't consider themselves like, oh, I don't think I'll... I'll, I'll do special data science also is attractive because they, they feel they miss something. And on the other hand, there is some students that come with very good background in computer science uh, programming that feel like I just need to uh, check that box, right? It's like, just tell me what it is. And, and as you say, it's like, yeah, I, I, yeah, it could be great to learn about projections, for example, <laughs> or things like that. Or it could be great to to look at the methods already existing in GIS or things like that. So I feel like part of the challenge, or I, and I can see as that as an opportunity, is to, like that communication between the two groups. I can see when they just talk between them, like like the like the, the feedback, like it's it's great, like the, the projects are going to be better. So I just think that if this happened in a, in a small environment, in a classroom, what could happen? like in, in industry, like solving problems also. So yeah, I think um, thinking about the challenges, I also feel like it's like a bit of how do we feel about what we do <laughs> and also how we communicate what we do and also a bit about confidence, I, I will say too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, I've seen this a lot in industry as well. And I actually think it gets a lot to, Yano, your point about um, how, uh, or no, actually, uh, well, this conversation, Yano, you've made some uh, really interesting points. And, and also, um, Johannes, you've made an interesting point about, like, we need to be clear about the differences so that we're recognizable as a discipline. And I think that's really interesting. And, and it comes up a lot in conversations like this. I, I agree, it's a really interesting point because on one hand we need to, like what, I, what I've seen in industry is we have this big challenge where you've got the GIS folks sit here and the data scientists sit here and they're not even working together. And yet if they did, it would be so much more powerful than them working independently. Um, and I think that that gets at this, I think that that's really related to this question about how we both um, acknowledge the, the very special and important value that we bring as spatial data scientists and with our deep knowledge of geography and spatial science, um, but also see ourselves in the broader scope of this bigger umbrella of data science. I definitely don't think that it's a, that the the spatial analysis is all of data science. I, I, of course not. There's lots of areas beyond it, but I do think we fill this very important sub area that if we don't if we don't help the next generation of GIS folks and of spatial scientists see themselves in this world, then they're not gonna feel empowered to connect with those data scientists in the way that they need to. Um, right now, the hierarchy in industry is de definitely has data scientists above GIS analysts. And that's a real shame because at the end of the day, they're both absolutely critical to solving these problems that these organizations are trying to solve. And so I think that um, embracing this evolution but also absolutely focusing on what makes spatial special and helping the the kind of mainstream data science programs like in the same way it's almost like we we need to see within academia more partnership you know it's not like we're going to create all the data scientists as geography programs and also uh, data science and computer science programs aren't going to create all the spatial data scientists but if we were working together in the same way that in industry we need those groups to be working together like the sum of the parts is so much greater um, because the expertise on both sides it multiplies um, and so i think that that's a big like collaboration, I, I think, and I, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but I, it's all related. It's like one of our greatest strengths as geographers is how interdisciplinary we are. Um, mm -hmm. We fundamentally understand that as geographers, we're not going to solve the problems all by ourselves as a field. We know that we will 
um, only solve these problems by partnering and collaborating with folks from other fields, subject matter expertise from across all these other disciplines. And I think that that is something missing from data science. <laughs> if you look at how we define data scientists, all these Venn diagrams, and I always say this in every conversation I have about this, but like the person who exists at the center of that Venn diagram, who's a computer scientist, a statistician, a subject matter expert, a great communicator, like, have you ever met that person? Mm -hmm. I have not met that person. And so to me, it feels like the only way to get there is with many people, with many different subject matter expertise. And I think that that's, something that we bring to the table as geographers, we really get that and we could share that with the data science community and we could bring together these two groups in a really powerful way and help the next generation <clears throat> of spatial scientists make a bigger impact than we're currently able to make because of this division that exists. It's not one or the other. It's really yeah. all about multidisciplinary dis, 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 and also the holistic approach to solve the, the problems, then we just have to make sure that we all that's the equal here to be, uh, to be considered here. Um, there's a question in the, in the audience in here. Um, that's from Oliver. Um, Oliver say that what will be the shared language between data science and GIS fault teams? To me, if I had to pick a shared language that I wish it would be, like my gut reaction was data, but I hate that. <laughs> um, I actually think what I hope the shared language will be is about questions and problems mm -hmm. and really focusing on, on the thing we're trying to understand or, or um, make a decision about. Because way too often, and this is everybody's guilty of this data science GIS, it doesn't matter is, you know, we're walking around with hammers and everything looks like a nail. And so we're just hammering away at screws and whatever else you're not to, supposed to hammer. And I think that if we could focus on the problem we're trying to solve, then as data scientists and GIS folks, we could come together around finding the best tools to solve the problem when the focus is the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, um, there's a quote that I love uh, from uh, Richard Hemming. Uh, the purpose of computing is inside, not just the numbers. So I think if these two disciplines can come together in the same spot, like, like how we can bring insight to our problem solving and maybe special thinking, maybe just like merging data, like understanding like how we can put our brains and just solve this problem in a better way so that we can not just focus on how things are happening what to what what things are happening but where things are happening and where things will be happening so it will be um i think that will be the shared language um for me all right okay so let's move on to the to, to the third Question. We move on to the teaching in here um, because it's a, it's a lot of students uh, and the next generation as well that uh, that need to be aware of the data science um, and spatial data science is is they, is equally they need to to know about them. So the question is, when teaching data science, how can we move beyond teaching just just the how to? How can we make sure that we are teaching special thinking and concept, especially as our students are increasingly from outside of the field of geography? Okay. So we want to bring awareness of the spatial components to the to non geographer as well, right? So probably for this, let's start with Marcella first. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this because I I think. Um, like part of the, like many of the classes I'm teaching right now, not many, but most of the classes I'm teaching right now, um, students work on a final project for that, for that class. And then they work for a capstone project or so. And I can see from students, like in general, like I enroll this class and I want to learn Python, I want to learn R, I want to just do this thing. And one of the things that I, I, I think really change a bit the, the mind is like 
like uh, asking them about identifying the, the, the question they want to solve. Like, and this is related with what Lauren was saying is like, um, they, they are like in terms of also the skills they need, right? They just don't need R and Python, but it's like, what are the questions they are trying to solve is is not easy for some of them. It's like it's it's very easy to go and click or do, go and start playing with the code, but but going back and and identify the question shouldn't be the case. Like so, mm, I, like I don't know if, if it's how can we effectively teach, but I think like those courses uh, where there is a project related where students work in their own data, real world problem problems and then they identify a questions and then break that question into little like questions or steps they can follow uh it teach uh, not just the how to do it the thing but also like the basics like the like the concepts they they need to cover to address a, a question so this is something that is different like from teaching like a lower division class than an upper division class and also i am saying this here that most of the classes i am teaching is because they are graduate level uh, courses but i i can definitely see that as an opportunity in those upper divisions and graduate uh, courses uh to really think about more project-oriented courses um than like teaching and uh, giving the step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. Yeah, I can I can relate with you, Marcella. Here at uh, at my team as well at ESRI, we actually sometimes do the capstone project with the students. And interestingly, lately is more from non-geographer. So from non-geography, so from the business analytic, from the information system, computer science, and all them ready for like, crunching the, the data into mm -hmm. machine learning, all the model, Python and everything. And the first thing that we do, we actually pair them with the real world, our client problem that they have mm -hmm. to solve. And the first thing that we teach them is a special thinking, how to do special thinking because they haven't tried it yet. And then after that, they, they got the special thinking component. Then we just give the list of the uh, tools that they can choose and, and use. It doesn't have to be one or the other. They just choose the, which one that they can solve the, uh, the problem. And they're really good in learning by themselves, give them you know the lessons. And tool is easy to learn. But the special thinking part is the one that we need to introduce to them. And after that, at the end of the project, I, I can see that they like on like my god this is so powerful this all that we can see the data on the on the map so i and, think based on that it's really yeah yeah and just to that. just to uh, say something about what you just say also in, from as an instructor i have been also amazed by the different applications and the different problems they bring to class uh, so it's it's really an opportunity for both because when they, when they start learning sp special thinking or computational thinking, they will start to see patterns or how they can just apply the same um, mm -hmm. problem solving techniques to similar problems. So that's what, like how the science can be reproducible with different problem sets. And I think that's why it's key to start the special thinking slash computational thinking before you teach programming, because that's how a, special problem can be solved um, um, and that's why it's important and this is i think how we learn and everything i mean it's it's not just python or r but even in the spoken language i mean you don't just sit make a one-year-old sit in front of you okay here is the grammar here's the alphabet just learn um, and use the words and start reading kind of education so i mean you they, they learn spoken language by examples of everyday life so start with every word so this is like if you how, how much you can link the real life examples with programming i think that will definitely help students to thrive um thinking computationally as well i don't i don't have a ton to add i love i think that the i the idea of kind of project-based learning and um particularly i the power of um, 
kind of solving real problems and having almost stakeholders and like a customer, since on some level that's the real uh, uh, for especially for those that are going to go that are going to go out and be you know spatial science professionals out in the world. Um, so much of the work that we end up doing is for somebody, right? Like we're not kind of coming up with the problem and going through the analysis and say, okay, well, that's good. That's good. I feel good about this and moving on. Like it, what's good will depend on if it meets the needs of somebody else. And I think that um, having that experience is also really valuable because what you realize, my experience has been, I'm actually very happy with how much I get um, folks asking, it's like, okay, I, I, I've learned about this. I'm using the tools, but I'm having trouble um, helping my decision makers, my boss, other people in my organization understand what I've done. Um, and I think that's also a really important piece of this. It's like you realize how you realize how deeply you have to understand it when you have to explain it and teach it to somebody else or help somebody understand what you've done. And I think the act of having to do that as well could be really valuable to students. You know, not just oh, you know, I predicted with ninety-seven percent accuracy because it feels like that's the only way we gauge if uh, you know good good work has been done in some of the spaces of, of data science, machine learning. It's just how how close can you get the model? But can you explain what you did? Um, because oftentimes it's when you're forced to do that, that you fill holes in your own knowledge. I mean, we all have holes in our knowledge. It's not anything against having those holes, but it's when you go to explain them, you realize that they're there and you fill them. And that's and that's a really healthy thing to be doing throughout your career, right? You're always going to be learning new things and tackling new problems and and applying new methods. Um, and I think helping folks learn how to learn about those methods and then how to explain them will be really important to their success. Awesome. Thank you, Lawrence. Well, let's move on here. Um, let's focus now on the students and uh, practitioners of GIS and geography how we can help them uh, to see th themselves as the data scientists that they are. So back to this, I think uh, among us, the panelists, we're talking about uh, the the syndrome, imposter syndrome here, that we not really like feel adequate enough as a data scientist. How are we going to address this? Who wants to start first? I, I can... I can start and just talk a little bit about my experience, which has been, I mean, it's certainly a soapbox of mine. I feel I watch some incredibly talented analysts, like blow my mind so much smarter than me, so much more knowledgeable than me, not feel comfortable kind of embracing this, the, this idea that they're spatial data scientists. And I think that if you're doing great analysis, you're manipulating and understanding really deeply spatial data, which is pretty complex data to understand. It's uh, I, when I talk to more traditional data scientists, the best analogy I have for them is is how complex um, and nuanced temporal data is, because it feels like that's an area that traditional data science does spend more time on. And they really get it because there are so many parallels between space and time in terms of how things are related and dependence. Um, and uh, that, that, like, we have this deep understanding of a very complex type of data that is fundamental to understanding how our world works. And we really need students coming out of school with these degrees to see themselves as having a really important place at the table. And it's not, I don't really care. I mean, you can call yourself a GIS, a, geog a, a GIS analyst, a geographer, a spatial data scientist. It doesn't really matter what people want to call themselves. But what I'm seeing is that there's a table and we're often not at it um, when it comes to these really, these really kind of, um, big organizations building these really amazing, powerful data science teams. And we're just not at the table for solving some of those big problems. And I do think that part of it is in our confidence um, about the skills and the knowledge that we have. And I, I think that that's a shame because 
the skills and the knowledge that we have are critical. I I I want to I want to just share a story <laughs> that has to do with that confidence part. And I don't know, I, I have been thinking a lot about how much weight we put about uh, teaching programming, which I don't, I'm not saying the opposite. I think it really helps and it really, it's crucial and everything, but, but I have this student who has been working in the field for many years. When she came to the program, he was pre pretty much getting the certificate and everything and was addressing interesting questions with, with her work, um, uh, and everything and we have this discussion about and i suggest that she should she should use art like it was something simple in art to do like it was geographically weighted integration or something and and uh, it was the first time she was gonna use art and then she come up three days four days later and did the whole thing and then the the first thing she told me is like no but i didn't i didn't code like i ran the code from someone else and i was like yeah, but that's good, right? Like you solved it. No, 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 no. And then she had a problem with the code and she has to code a bit herself. And then she was saying like, she didn't do the thing. Like the thing is like, and she was like, Marcela, every time I click enter on my computer, I was like, thinking that the computer was gonna explode or something. And I was like, I feel like at the end, my conclusion is like, I and pretty much also my, my message was like trying to tell her like, pretty much every, like, this is a, a process, right? It's like never, you you are not going to never feel like, oh, you are like pretty much the best programmer ever. And you know, all languages like you are going to feel same way usually. And it's kind of, you learn to live with that. And I, I just say sharing this because also as a student, there was an instructor who gave a lecture about uh, imposter syndrome and what does that feel and everything and it really was a, a, a um, it was very important for me in that moment so I, I kind of like to have that conversation with the students because sometimes and many times they don't know what they are doing it's just this thing but sometimes it's not just this thing they are doing great things as well so <laughs> and I think you're touching a really great point Marcella because I mean the question is, do they really need to be an expert in programming? No, I think no, because, I mean, this is a great skill to have, but we don't know. I mean, maybe I'm always talking about the future today, but I mean, we don't know if you're going to need Python or R in 10 years. Maybe, I mean, because, I mean, it, it evolves in a very different way. So, I mean, it is great to think computationally or get those skill sets today, but they don't have to be experts in order to be uh, great of what they are doing. So um, I know I have seen a lot of uh, students discouraged because of they can't understand Python at all and they can't do scripting, but they can use the existing tools or they can understand the co concepts. More importantly, they can solve the problems. So, so programming should be just a support for students or GIS uh, researchers to solve their problems. It shouldn't be a torture for themselves. So I think we should be clear about this too, this distinction too. Yeah, I also, I wanna, I'm sharing in the chat a link to an article that I really loved in Harvard Business Review. Um, titled stop telling women they have imposter syndrome and not i mean we've we've talked a lot about it and like imposter syndrome is real and like self-doubt is real and all of those things but i think there's this other piece of it and that article is written from the point of view of two women of color um and it's it's a really interesting point of view which is also about the the structural organizational reasons that women feel that they have imposter syndrome and it's not actually imposter syndrome it's just it's not being treated well, not being invited to the table, not being welcome at the table. And so I do think that there's this other piece of it, which is that as organizations, um, whether it's academic organizations or industry organizations, we also are responsible for creating environments that don't make people feel this way. 
Um, and so we, we as leaders and researchers and people who are creating the next generation of leaders, we need to be also modeling what it's like to create an inclusive space where people with different skill sets all are valued at that table, right? Um, because I know for myself, I'm surrounded by people who are better than me at lots of different things. And it's easy to value the things you don't have, you know, like I'm not a great programmer. It just never was, um, it never, it, it never made me feel happy. And I try to do things that make me feel happy. And so I really value that skill and probably am guilty of feeling less than about that skill because I don't have it. And so I really value it in other people. It's like, I basically, if you're better at that than me, I consider you smarter than me on some level. But what I try to do is create an inclusive team environment where everybody's different skills mm -hmm. are valued just as much. And I think that that really is an important piece of this is, um, you know, we, we need to help build up that confidence, but part of how we build up that confidence is by creating inclusive environments where people feel welcome and feel valued for their unique contributions to our teams. It's actually even nicer if it's like, if, if everybody has different skills that we actually bring together and then solve the, the problems. Yep. Thank you. Um, I, I I just want to point out the comments from uh, Katrina here uh, on on and Seda and Marcella. Even the best traditional software programmers know when to use someone else's library code instead of re writing something from scratch. And Seb does say exactly that's why we even reinvent the wheel, right? If there is there, I think I think the the skill that you can actually solve the the problem with many different way. Um, that's 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 will be um, saving a lot of time and effort. Okay. Uh, well, since we only have six minutes to go, why don't we wrap it up with the last question in here? Uh, it's kind of like the closing, and and if each of us can give our comment on this. So, what is so important for geographer to be at the table when it comes? to this growing world of data science. In other words, is what do geographers have to offer that is so critical as we tackle these huge challenges that the world is facing? I think we talk a lot about this uh, a lot, but it, let's, let's give a summary on this then. Feel free, who wants to start first? So, I think the location is future is, is present. It, it was past, it is present, it's future. So I can't think of an insight without location. Maybe this is how my brain is wired. I don't know. It's impossible for me to think us spatially. So um, it, it, I mean, I've been in the, the part of the equation where we were just trying to solve the problems without thinking spatially as an engineer. But now if we would like to bring insight to our special problem solving, any problem solving, we have to think special, special too. I mean, in climate change, it could be disaster management, you, you name it. I mean, it could be anything, but if you don't think about where it's happening or where it's going to happen, then your solution won't be fulfilled. I mean, it, it won't be 100%. Thank you, Sarah. That's exactly. Marcella? I was just thinking, like, just as an example, I do remember when I started working with Twitter data and trying to use Twitter for disaster and everything. And I saw, like, oh, as a grad student, it's like, oh, there are many tools already, it already exist. Like, they already create this cool thing and everything. And when I realized, it's like, yeah, but no one asked where is these people tweeting. If, like, it's like, but for me, it was like super logical. In, like, are those algorithms considering like if that tweet is gonna be more reliable because they they are from the area at risk or something like that? So I was just thinking like it's, it's, this is just an example of what you just say, say that that yeah I think we can bring like like at different lenses to problems that seem that already have a solution or have a like a tool like existing tools. So that's why we should be there. <laughs> Um, yeah, mine comes back to the point I was making earlier about um, 
our ability to bring things together and connect things that don't seem connected. I think that that's, I think that's the deepest power of geography. I think that the way that it connects things, both data and people, um, fields and industries and concepts, I think that it is one of our greatest strengths as, um, as geographers, as, as spatial scientists. Uh, and I think that um, it's increasingly important right now that we have folks like that involved in solving these problems to bring together these these different fields. And, and I do see definitely a lot more understanding of the value that geography has. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, what I'm seeing is there is definitely, you know, we're seeing some spatial operations being added into more traditional um, packages or software. And I think that's great. It brings spatial into some more mainstream places. But I do think that it's not, I mean, it's just like any other tool, right? It's dangerous if you don't understand it. And I think that um, we have to, we have this, this responsibility to um, make sure that we're, we're really pushing for how to really think spatially. You know, it's not just X, Y coordinates. Geography is not just another field in a data set. It's about how things are connected. And, and that's really, really important in most of the problem. I mean, these problems that we're trying to solve are so deeply interconnected that if we don't have that, bring that approach, we won't solve them. And for me, it's, I think it's because nowadays we can see that more and more spatial data is available um, from the sensor, from people movement and everything. It's, you can see the trend that the, even, even non-geography or non-geographers is really try to learn the spatial analysis, uh, taking the courses on that because they, they be, in the job market, they, there is a high demand on unlock how to use all this spatial data. Okay. So I think the, the, that's the geographer um, can offer the, the spatial thinking, spatial analysis, um, and they, they equal with others because others also start to, to see the power of this spatial data together. Okay. And you can see all in the comment. Thank you for everybody that commenting as well. Um, um, on our session in here, especially the last uh, message on that. So um, this has been a very fun panel, I feel, that uh, everybody have uh, chimed in nicely and also the panelists. Thank you for Seda, Marcella, Lawrence, the, uh, for all the sharing the information in here in the panel. Thank you for all of you that staying until the end. Um, have a great evening in Europe and have a good, a great uh, morning, afternoon or evening everywhere else. Um, back to you, Kitty.